first guest for the show tonight is Alex Berry, the um, founder and inventor at Sutru. Welcome to the show, Alex. Thanks Thank for joining you. us today. So we've got some fun facts about you. <laughs> <laughs> first off, apparently you have a total of 283 sutras or other stitches yourself. I do. I'm, I'm quite accident prone. It's not actually the reason that I invented the device that we're showing you, uh, but I average every two and a half years ending up in hospital for one reason or another. <laughs> Oh. Um. And another fun fact is, um, we were talking about this before the show started, but about 3D printing. So your device is actually in the Design Museum in London, showing what 3D printing is capable of. That's right. We're in a exhibition called Designer, Maker, User, uh, which is a seven-year exhibition. And we're in a section um, next to a 3D printer, showing what the end result of printing can do um, with a medical device. Okay, well, I'll go and take a look. Are you ready to do your pitch? I am. Great, you've got 10 minutes. Thank you. So I started Sutru about 10 years ago when I saw a documentary on robotic surgery and how stitches were done at the time um, by a set of forceps. For the next five years, I worked on a mechanism to, uh, to increase the, the way that a suture could be done. Um, and um, in 2012, we started Sutru, um, which led on to, in 2013, uh, uh, putting in for our patent. And the devices that you can see on this image are the range that we're working on at the moment. So the manual process of uh, stitches hasn't changed for thousands of years. Um, what we've come up with is a series of devices using the same mechanism. Uh, the device performs a perfect stitch each time and can uh, work with a range of different sizes and types of needles. One of the problems that you have uh, performing a stitch is something called a needle stick injury. Uh, this is where a healthcare worker uh, jabs themselves accidentally with a needle after it's been used on a patient, which obviously leads to a risk of infection. Needle stick global injuries uh, amount to 1.6 million a year. Uh, they include hypodermic needles. Uh, 400,000 of these are injuries directly resulting from suturing needles. Um, there's about 2% of all surgeries have needle stick injuries during the, uh, during the surgery. And about 10% of healthcare workers re have reported a needle stick injury in the last 12 months. Needle stick is very important and it then leads to the benefits that we have uh, for uh, the different users uh, within uh, hospitals, surgeons and eventually for patients. Uh, for hospitals, um, there's reduced litigation if you have a device where um, your uh, legislation has already been passed where needle stick injuries um, are asked to be prevented by the legislation. Um, so hospitals have reduced risk of litigation. Um, we believe there will be a reduced cost in surgery due to time. And then going on for surgeons, there is um, a reduced risk of infection again. There's the automatic uh, performing of a stitch, which is quite a complex uh, performance done by hand. And then for patients, you have shorter waiting times within the hospital for reduced times. Um, you have um, uh, less scarring by using a device that uh, turns a needle in a perfect arc, uh, which then leads to aesthetic appearance. And um, the waiting times overall between the hospital surgeons and the patients is reduced as well. So we have two devices, two types of devices. We have a handheld device and we have a, a keyhole device. So the handheld device is um, a handle with what plugs onto what, what we call a head. And on that head is a cartridge. Contained in the cartridge is the needle and thread. Uh, on average per patient, you use three threads. So you attach a head per patient to the handle, and by pressing a button, you perform a stitch. 
when you have completed uh, a thread, so when you've run out of thread on one needle, you can then replace the cartridge with a fresh needle and thread and continue. And when you are finished with the patient, you then throw away the head and the handle is multi-use. This applies to both uh, human medicine and also veterinary medicine. The second device that we have is a keyhole device or an endoscopic device or in some cases a robotic device. So the mechanism is the same, uh, but it's much smaller because it's a keyhole device. Um, you have the endoscopic one which is controlled by hand by a surgeon and then the robotic one attaches to a robot where the surgeon performs remotely. Um, our device um, will allow for uh, suturing around corners, it's articulated, it also ties knots and we demonstrated this earlier in the year um, with analogous materials in uh, a hospital on a robot showing how uh, it can perform all the tasks that we wanted it to perform. So there have been approximately 10,000 patent attempts to uh, create a device that can rotate a needle, a standard suturing needle. And ours is the first device to be able to do that. Um, the patents go back to 1914. Our patent started in um, 2013 and was granted last year in the EU and the US. Uh, several other territories where it's already granted. There are three that are outstanding at the moment, but this is due to backlog, not actually a question of the patent. And we recently got a report from the EU Patent Office that our patent was entirely uncon uncontested, which uh, we're told is quite rare. Uh, we've been working with um, several surgeons during um, the development of the device. Um, as the end users, so um, for future use and also um, for the efficacy of the device, um, this has helped us during the whole process. We have uh, a, a team now um, that incorporates engineers, we have marketing experts, clinicians, um, people in finance, um, and are ready for our team to expand as we go on to the next phase of work which will be um, design to manufacture and regulation and then trials. We've also been in several magazines uh, for engineering and for medicine. We were on BBC Click uh, a few years ago and we were also recently uh, interviewed by the Financial Times. In terms of our uh, revenue model. Great, thanks Alex. I think it's fantastic, you know, helping people, saving lives. I feel so sorry for the doctors and the surgeons, you know, so dangerous. So they, they believe that only one in 10 are actually reported. Um, and there are, you, you have black gloves available mm -hmm. to healthcare workers so you can hide an injury. So mm -hmm. the, the figures are unknown and it's mystical figures because people don't uh, report all the time. So they could be much, much larger than, uh, than we know of at the moment. In terms of the commercialization of, of this, because clearly there's a critical need within the, you know, not only the hospitals, but you talked about the vets as well. Um, how are you going to commercialize this? Is it likely to turn into some sort of licensing model in the future? What are you thinking? It's likely. One of the advantages we have with our cartridge is that any manufacturer's needle and thread can go in there. So we could have either a, a larger uh, a medical company uh, wanting to license it exclusively or we could be manufacturing the, the head section and the handle and then the cartridge is something that's provided by the needle manufacturers. There's a range of different options we have here um, and we're investigating well, starting off with the veterinary uh, market. So do you see the vets in terms of the sequence of customers? How do you see that um, uh, you know, going forward? So vets first, um, simply because of the, the regulation that's necessary for vets is much smaller. Um, there's not really a consideration of cr cross-species contamination, which is the, the main point of regulation. 
Um, so uh, we have got a veterinary distributor that's interested. Um, we just have to set up the final design parts and the manufacturing. Um, and that market in the UK and the US to begin with in 2019 and then expanding from there. But also during that time, you'll have trials and evidence of its use on animals, which human medical trials start off with anyway. Yes. So you'll, you'll, you've got two different paths that you're taking, but one of them complements the other. Great. Sounds great. And um, for you, what are the next steps involved then? We're just uh, moving away, uh, we spoke beforehand, all of our previous um, prototypes were 3D printed. We've now come to the end of that, where we have a, a set series of components. 3D printing is great, uh, but not for mass manufacturing. So there's now a stage of design to manufacture in, in traditional materials um, and setting up that manufacturing because you obviously need uh, sterilization as well and clean rooms. After that, going into the distribution marketing for vets and then the regulation and the steps with humans as well. And um, these, uh, these prototypes, how many of them have you already created? Um, so we have 27 for the handheld and 11 for the endoscopic robotic, which are kind of the same thing. Um, so we've spent to date probably somewhere around 80 to 90 thousand pounds on prototyping through 3D printing, where we estimate in traditional manufacturing that would have been over 7 million pounds. Wow. That's so, that's and it's much quicker. Yeah, it's really amazing how that's changed the way mm. manufacturing is working and the ability of businesses like yours to create new products that just couldn't be produced with traditional methods. It is, and design is much easier because you can have something made and in your hand within a week, mm. um, and it's, it's pennies. And if you're wrong, it's not six months of waiting for something to be manufactured. You can move on very quickly. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Alex, for all we've got time for uh, tonight. Um, if you'd like to find out more about Sutru, you can do so at Investors. Uh, find them on uh, their website.